This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, and let us begin our rejoicing with singing Praise the Source of Faith and Learning. It's in the Black Songbook, number 2004. I invite you to stand as you are able to sing. to the First United Methodist Church as we celebrate Graduation Sunday. A special welcome to parents and grandparents of our graduates and visitors. Please pass and sign the pew pads located at the center aisle. Include your name, address, phone number, and email so that we may stay in touch with you. Everyone is invited to Fellowship Hall following worship for coffee and donuts. Follow the crowd towards the Fellowship Hall. 
Thanks to all who participated in the colorful Pride Parade yesterday, our Blessing Booth received third place for its warm and welcoming presence. <laughs> Following a musical offering, we will celebrate the special transition of our high school youth and our college young adults as they embark on the next chapter of their lives. Other announcements include the availability of the June Roseleaf, our church newsletter. It's available on the welcome table and in Fellowship Hall. Vacation Bible School is only a week away. Registrations may be made online or by picking up a registration form from the bulletin board in the breezeway on the way to getting your coffee and donut. Invite your neighbors, friends, and grandchildren to our Summer of Service beginning Tuesday, June 11th. Angel's Attic, our thrift store, is closing at the end of July. Volunteer assistance is greatly needed to reduce the inventory. Please see the bulletin for contact information if, if you can offer a few hours. And next Sunday is Pentecost. We will be confirming five of our youth at the 11 o'clock service and we will be receiving new members in worship at 9.30 and 11. Oh, and the color of Pentecost is red, so we invite you to wear red, orange, and yellow. Maybe even pink. <laughs> now let's all take a deep breath and prepare for our worship of the Lord. The call to worship is on the screen. A gift of a new day. Unlived, untried, ready to be opened. A new day with surprising breath blessings. With love to be given. Kindness to be shared. And peace to be enjoyed. A gift of a new day. God's given to us. Let us receive it with joy and, and live all our days. Will you join me in the prayer printed on the screen? Guiding light, we gather with open minds to listen to your teaching. Our spirits yearn to be fed with the bread of life. Our lives have been changed by your living word, and we hope for transformation in this season of life. Inspire us toward faithful living in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
As a church family, it is our joy and privilege to celebrate rites of passage in the lives of our church family members. Today we have that honor of celebrating the graduation of high school graduates and of college graduates. We invite the high school graduates who are with us to come forward for a moment so that we can recognize you and honor you and celebrate this grand accomplishment with you. We will invite you to come on up here so all can see you. You're all taller than I am, but, <laughs> but it helps to stand on high. So we welcome you. We uh, give thanks that you are present with us today after a big weekend of celebrating. And we um, invite you to share with us your names and the school that you're graduating from and your next steps in your, your life journey as we celebrate with you. I'm Jacqueline Hale. I graduated from Santa Rosa High School and I plan on going to the SRJC and doing the vet tech program. Great. My name is Marion Sereni, and I also graduated from Santa Rosa High School. I'm going to the JC and transferring to UC Davis. Um, I'm Tommy. I just graduated from Maria Creo High School, um, and I'm going to be going to UCSB next fall. Uh, my name is Kevin Sully. Uh, I graduated from Maria Creo, and I'll be going to Northern Arizona. Wonderful. That's great. Congratulations. We celebrate with you. We know that there are some parents and grandparents of <laughs> other high school graduates who are out there. Uh, Sue has the, the book for you that we're gifting our graduates with, the high school graduates. So if you would want to stand or raise a hand, Sue will bring you your book. And we want to acknowledge all the college graduates that are, are listed in our program as well. These uh, folks are taking that next step in their life journey. And, it will be a, a grand adventure for the next four or five or, or more years as you, uh, <laughs> or these days as, uh, as they continue their education. But we have a, a grand uh, list of college graduates listed here that are members of your family. And, and we congratulate all of you on this accomplishment. And we want to send you into your life with a, a blessing. So we invite you all to be in prayer. Gracious God of learning and of life, by your great wisdom we are taught the way and the truth. Bless our graduates as they complete high school and college and close this wonderful chapter in their lives. We thank you for teachers, family, leaders, and friends who have supported them along the way. Walk with these graduates as they cross this threshold into new beginnings. Enter into the stress and the anxiety of all that is unknown and bless them with trust in your presence and companionship with them always. Grant them insight and strength to use the gifts you have given them in service of you and their neighbor. May they be a blessing to those around them and may they see you and your loving presence in all they experience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go into the world with joy and gladness. Thank you. And members of the church's foundation board have another exciting presentation to make Joyce Milks and Charlene Simons are representing the foundation. Good morning. Um, Charlene and I are here this morning to talk just for a second about the foundation and then to present the, um, the scholarships for this year. The foundation was established in the mid-1980s with just a small amount of money, and it has now grown to over... Uh, a million and a half dollars. It's being managed by professional money managers in, um, on the peninsula through the California Nevada Foundation. Uh, a portion of the interest 
and the appreciation is used to uh, make grants uh, in different areas um, that are to cover things not covered by, that are to cover things that are not covered by our church budget. Uh, that includes music and children's programs, the building maintenance, and scholarships, which is why we are here today. Over the years, different people have uh, made significant contributions designated specifically for scholarships, and I'd just like to go through their names again, just so we don't forget. The Brinstein family, the Keller family, Ora Dale Gillette, uh, the Rankin family, Ann Rohde, Ida Baguette, the Petty John family, and um, Kay Choate Johnson and Marilyn Strand's family. Um, these are people who cared about education enough to, to establish, uh, to, to provide funds that will establish the scholarships that we're going to present today. So we have eight kids. Here we go. Um, and some were just up here. So, and some I know can't be here, but I'd like to read their names anyway, just to recognize them. Uh, Brian Chandler Garrison is going to Menlo College for his third year in marketing. Emma Kaminsky going to the University of Oregon uh, to do a second year in finance. Jacqueline Hale um, going to Santa Rosa Junior College. Um, if you want to come on up. Um, to do uh, the vet tech program. Lucas Street is going to the University of Washington. Uh, he had done two years at the, G uh, the JC in applied physics. Sarah Street going to the Santa Rosa Junior College to do her second year in nursing. Kevin Sully going to the Northern <laughs> Northern Arizona University to study cultural anthropology and be involved in the ROTC program. Thomas Sully is going to UC Santa Barbara, uh, doing a, his first year in economics. And then Zoe Valre, uh, Cal State uh, East Bay, her third year in sociology and African American studies. So we um, congratulate all the winners and these gifts go with uh, the best wishes of your church. We'll sing a song of prayer for you all. He leadeth me. May God lead you in your next pathways. We invite you to stand as you are able to sing.
Good heck, good morning, everybody. Uh, today I'll be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 16, 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to the Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Toros and took a straight course to Samantharis, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the woman who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyrea and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. In the late 1930s, before World War II began, Michael Billister visited a small village in Poland. He met a man in the village, and he offered the man a Bible. The man read the Bible, and he was converted to faith in Christ. He then passed the Bible on to others who were also converted until 200 people had come to believe in God through this single Bible. When Michael Billister returned to that town in 1940, this group of Christians met together for a worship service in which he was to preach the Word of God. He typically would ask the worshipers to offer testimonies, but this time he asked that several people in the audience recite verses of scripture. One man stood up and he asked, perhaps we have misunderstood. Did you mean verses or chapters? <laughs> now these villagers had not memorized a few select verses of the Bible. They had memorized whole chapters and books of the Bible. Thirteen people had memorized the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and half of Genesis. Another person had committed to memory the Psalms, 150 of them. That single copy of the Bible given by Michael Billister had sunk deeply into the community and the hearts of those who received it. The surprising results of that one small Bible had borne fruit that changed hundreds of lives. With all the big surprises in the book of Acts, it's amazing to find this small story of Lydia recorded here. Her story begins with a detour. Just prior to Paul's call to Macedonia, the scripture says that the Holy Spirit prevented him from going to Asia Minor and the spirit of Jesus had preempted his plans to go to another city. Instead, in a vision, a man calls him to Macedonia in what we know as the eastern part of Greece. Paul embarks upon a challenging mission in the cradle of Western culture, which leads him from Judaism's religious center in Jerusalem into Greece's intellectual center and eventually to Rome's political center. Through this detour to Macedonia, the course is set for Paul to broaden the reach of God's grace into what we know as Europe. This detour not only transformed individual lives, but entire communities and 
the world at that time. When he arrives, Paul finds not a man, but a group of women who listen to his teaching. This in itself is surprising given the times and the culture, but it is not surprising in the context of Luke and Acts, where women are honored and elevated in faith and roles of leadership. Lydia is a wealthy woman. She's a businesswoman who sells purple cloth to the rich and the powerful. Yet on the Sabbath, she takes a detour out of her circles of influence in Philippi to go outside the gates to the river. She goes to join other women there for prayer and worship. This minor detour leads to a major one when Lydia opens her heart to receive the words about Jesus and become a follower of Christ. She and her entire household are baptized and she goes on to offer hospitality to Paul and Silas in her home. A new spark is ignited in Macedonia that inspires the spread of the gospel far and wide. Today, we are mindful of our graduates and other life transitions. Our scripture invites us to consider the importance of detours and the importance of every single life. Detours can lead us to new and life-shaping adventures. Some people like to take detours, going off the beaten path to experience a serendipitous opportunity. Others much prefer to follow a planned course of action without deviating into, from the original design. Last week, I saw several references to a new book by scientist David Epstein. It's called Range. Why generalists triumph in a specialized world. Epstein suggests that starting a specialized path early and doggedly sticking to it may not be as rewarding as trying a variety of things and quitting those things one finds unfulfilling. Now, last week there was a notable exception to his thesis the 565 middle school students who qualified for participation in the National Spelling Bee were delighted to be there and even to experience the unprecedented eight champions who perfectly mastered 20 rounds of words from Webster's Dictionary. No matter the obscurity or the difficulty of those words, these eight students could not be stumped. They had obviously prepared for this event with dogged determination, coaches, specialized software, and years of study, even though they are only 12, 13, and 14 years old. The Octochamps must feel a great sense of fulfillment at having beat the dictionary and set a world record. But David Epstein would suggest that these spelling champions also try other adventures besides spelling bees as they chart their life path. He argues that many of the most effective people in elite professional fields such as sports, art, and scientific research succeed not despite the fact, but because they find their way to that particular field after first pursuing other adventures. For example, Tiger Woods' childhood was consumed with specializing in golf under his father's tutelage. In contrast, Roger Federer, considered by many to be the greatest male tennis player of all time, played several sports in childhood and adolescence. Having seen Roger's love of playing sports, his parents encouraged him to try a variety of sports or to have a sampling, as Epstein calls it. 
Federer himself credits the hours that he spent dabbling in basketball, handball, skiing, wrestling, swimming, table tennis, and skateboarding with helping him develop his hand-eye coordination that's so critical to his tennis playing. Sampling periods allow children to discover organically what they love and want most to succeed in. Detours that lead us off the beaten or proven path can be transforming, taking us in new, exciting, and unanticipated adventures. As Paul and Lydia experienced, detours can lead us deeper into fulfillment in the journey of life and faith. Although not all detours are wanted or pleasant, God promises to accompany us, whatever the challenge, and God seeks to be in the midst, redeeming it. This short story in our scripture also demonstrates that every single yes, life has the value of a single life. Our words and our actions make an impression for good or for ill. In this season of commencement addresses, one that stands out is Robert Smith's address to Morehouse College, the alma mater of Martin Luther King Jr. Near the end of his speech, he put into action one of the rules he admonished the graduates to live by. We have a responsibility to liberate others. He says, we will all be measured by how much we contribute to the success of the people around us. Each of you must become a community builder. And then, as an act of liberation, he announced that his family is making a grant to eliminate the student loans of the 396 graduates of Morehouse's class of 2019. I'm sure our students are sorry that they're not in that class. <laughs> that gift is estimated at nearly $40 million. He challenged the graduates to pay it forward and to continue the cycle of generosity. Well, I was curious to know more about this man and, and what inspired him to make such a transforming gift in the lives of people he doesn't even know in such an extravagant way. I learned that as a child, he watched his mother send off a $25 check to the United Negro College Fund each month. With her example, he became dedicated to funding programs that help inner-city children by introducing them to technology. The actions of his mother early in his life modeled the importance of philanthropy. Her gifts had a huge ripple effect through the generosity of her billionaire son. Never underestimate the difference that can be made by one person's words and actions. When our journey leads us into detours, how have we seen God's guiding work leading us into new opportunities and fresh adventures? What is God inviting us to learn from detours? Whom is God calling us to serve when our course changes direction? How can the words and actions of our lives make a difference in the lives of those whom we encounter, even on an unexpected path? Go back to that story of the little town in Poland in which 200 people shared and memorized chapters from a single Bible. It reminds us that the faithfulness of one person can change other lives. One single Bible shared, one faithful risk taken 
One can change another's lives and surprisingly shake the foundation even of entire communities. Now, we need not be billionaires to make a significant impact. Like Paul, we must be open to God's call, even when it requires a detour from our carefully laid plans. Like Lydia, we can share our faith in natural ways that can change other hearts and lives, one loving deed at a time. May we listen to God's call to loving action this day and every day. Amen. I invite you to be still for our time of prayer. Trustworthy God, we are grateful for your ever-present spirit. You are always near to provide a comforting word, a gentle nudge, a vision inspiring hope. We look to you for guidance at present moments in our lives, for some a point of transition or uncertainty, for others a time of stability. Enter in and lead us forward into new life and faithful discipleship. We pray for many in our nation who are experiencing the trauma of floodwaters and tornadoes in the Midwest. Offer your comfort and solace to city employees, families, friends, and citizens grieving the tragic loss of life in Virginia Beach. Empower all who feel their rights have been violated or diminished. We pray for immigrants desperately seeking a safe land in which to live and work. We pray for students and staff and family members of Santa Rosa High School following a frightening event on Friday. And we pray for the student who caused the scare, asking that you would help him be made whole in body, mind, and spirit. Wherever there is despair, O God, offer your hope. And where there is chaos, offer your peace and guidance. We lift to you those whom we know and love, praying for the healing hand of Christ to rest upon them. We pray for Emma, for Bob and Margie, Gerald, B, Jasmine, Coral, Harold, John, Larry, Dan, George, Sarah, Alfred, Shirley, Jan, and others whom we name in our hearts. We pray, O oh God, for your church, the body of Jesus Christ on earth today, and for the United Methodist Church. As annual conferences meet around the country, inspire us with a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Grow us into loving as Jesus loved and serving as Jesus served. Offer your guiding presence to leaders and citizens around the world. Enter into areas marked by strife to guide them toward peaceful living. We give you thanks for those who offer their lives in the service of our military. We remember those whose lives have been sacrificed and those who have returned home and yet injured in body, mind, or spirit. Offer them your comfort, your peace, and the hopes of new beginnings. We lift our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
We have the privilege this day of dining at the Lord's Supper. All people who wish to re renew their fellowship with God and with one another invited to the Lord's table, wherever you are in the journey of faith, you are welcome here. Following the Lord's Prayer, we will invite you forward. The ushers will lead you, and the servers will offer you a piece of bread to dip in the cup. Afterwards, if you'd like to kneel at the, at the communion rail, you're welcome to do so. There also is a gluten-free option for the bread, and the cup is non-alcoholic. As we prepare for Holy Communion, I invite you into a time of prayer. Creator God, you fashioned a wondrous world full of springtime beauty and surprising delight. You peopled your world with human beings like us, that we might enjoy your creation and that we might be faithful stewards of this wondrous world. We give you thanks for all of your creation in its beauty and its diversity. We are honored that we have the opportunity to enjoy the wondrous array of cultures, of countries around this globe. Forgive us, O oh God, when we stray from your good desire for our lives. You continue to offer us forgiveness and set us upon a healthy path where we might grow deeper in our love of you and love of our neighbor. We give you thanks for your son, Jesus, for his life and ministry, his death, people up with a healing touch, with a kind word, with a loving gaze into their face, all of which said, you are God's beloved. You are a member of God's loving family. We remember that holy meal in which Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, he blessed it, and he shared it with his beloved friends, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is a cup of a new covenant, a covenant of everlasting forgiveness and love. Drink this as often as you will in remembrance of me. We offer ourselves then in union with Christ's sacrifice for us. Make our lives a holy and living sacrifice to you, O God, and pour out your Holy Spirit afresh on your people gathered here and upon these gifts. As we feast upon this meal, unite us in community through the love of Christ and the bonds of your Holy Spirit. Fill us with the very presence of Christ that we might be Christ's hands and feet in this broken world. <coughs> We lift our prayer in the name of Christ and we unite our voices to pray as he taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this holy meal in which you offer yourself to us once again. Indeed, fill us with the presence of Christ, that we might know your companionship with us, and that we might be the presence of Christ in this world. In his name we offer ourselves to living and loving as Christ. Amen. And we invite you to stand and sing. Our closing song is At the Font We Start Our Journey. Friends in Christ, God calls us, for Easter's work must still be done. We indeed are the hands and feet of Christ. As you go forth to answer the call of Christ, wherever life leads you, may you know that the God of love is with you. Jesus, our Redeemer, upholds us, and the Holy Spirit guides and comforts us. Amen. Thank you.